Hey y'all, welcome back to Mind Matters with Dr. Jada. I am Dr. Jada, licensed mental health counselor and licensed professional counselor supervisor. And today I am, of course, talking about the new saga of P. Diddy. And it's been a wild ride for the music icon, Sean Diddy Combs. And just imagine this, a roller coaster of shocking allegations, federal raids, and legal drama that's turning heads in not only the music industry, but in every industry. I started watching this, of course, when Cassie came forward and talked about um, the sexual trauma and um, assaults that she had been through. And of course, for those of you who know, I am a trauma therapist and uh, sexual assault is my wheelhouse. And um, the first thing I thought is, I wonder what she um, endured during that period of time. And so, interestingly enough, four women have stepped forward accusing Diddy of some pretty serious stuff. And we're talking about rape, assault, and of course, other disruptive um, behavior and, and just sketchy stuff that has um, taken place that stretches all the way back 30 years ago. And so when I looked at this, I was like, what in the world? What in the world is going on? Because it's reminiscent of, of course, R. Kelly. And so again, I unpacked, um, and actually I, you know, um, have, you know, spoken to um, people in that um, space with R. Kelly and some of the things that took place. And, and it just was not a good situation. It's just not, a, it's not a good look, to be honest. Um, so again, rape, assault, and of course, some other very disturbing stuff. So also get this, one of those accusations of rape and assault involves a minor. And we never like to see that, especially because, again, pe most people are like, well, you know, back in the day, you could get married and you were 13 and 14. And I'm like, yeah, that was back in the day. Because the reality is, at any age under 25, you still have an adolescent brain. Your brain is still being formed and so, you know, it's just not um, a good look when minors are involved either. And so, again, um, the plot obviously thickens and um, this is it's real life. You know, it, it's happening in L.A. And, you know, again, that's the the mecca of, you know, Hollywood blockbuster movies and all. But this is real life. This is this is someone's real life. And unfortunately, um, it's taken a, a very hard left turn and it is not pretty. So um, this story gets a little crazier, I, I think, because. Of course, the feds have come in raiding Diddy's mansion in Los Angeles and my Miami again. And I hate to say it's like out of an action movie, but it is it, like it looked that way. I, I was sitting there going, what's going on? And I'm not really sure. And I'm looking closer. And then I read the the lower thirds and I'm like, Diddy. And then I'm like, I see the, you know, I guess it was a, it looked really awesome. It was it seemed like it was a drone shot, but it was very clear and you could see, you know, you just had a really great view into what was taking place. But it looks like a Hollywood blockbuster movie or something. But the feds came in, raided Diddy's mansions, both in Los Angeles and Miami. And again, the agents were armed. They, um, guns blazing. Um, I don't know who they were searching for, but I did eventually, you know, I saw them bring out a couple of people, hands behind the head. And I think at one point, somebody's hands were hot behind their back. And you could tell that um, whatever they were looking for, they either knew where they were going because, again, at one point they brought a ladder in and they had the ladder prepped and ready to go in to access something. Um, but in the midst of all of this chaos, um, one of the people that they did bring out was someone who was close to Diddy, um, Brendan Paul. And um, my understanding is he was he he's described as Diddy's like right hand man and also involved in some of this shady stuff, this shady business. And so um, 
he gets busted at the airport with drugs in his bag, adding another layer of intrigue to this already mind blowing situation that's taking place. And then um, looking at this overall, Diddy, his former girlfriend, and this is what I mentioned earlier, Cassie, um, accused him of what I consider to be some horrifying, horrifying things, including um, forcing her into really what I, I think as a woman and as a therapist, some really unspeakable situations with other men. And so again, this is unfolding, you know, like a movie right before our eyes, but um, did he, you know, he's not really backing down. He, he, he took to social media and um, he proclaimed his innocence and he vowed to fight tooth and nail to clear his name. Now, I kind of think this is a, a epic battle. You know, it's it's of epic proportions um, with no shortage of ins and outs and twists and turns. But the whole world is, of course, watching. And I'm not really sure how it's going to unfold. But my question is, I, again, you know, I, I look at things from a psychological perspective and I want to know um, not only what's the psychology behind it, but what's the behavioral implications of, you know, why people do what they do. And if they said they didn't do it, then why do people come forward and say that they did do it? And then why are these allegations so graphic in nature? And if they're talking about rape, assault, and um, or sexual assault and other disturbing acts, um, you know, why would someone make this up? And then, um, you know, I heard some of the feedback from people who are close to the Diddy camp. And there is a thread of consistency from one person to the next about the parties, um, the things that happen behind closed doors. And again, as I said before, is very reminiscent of um, R. Kelly. And it made me think of the drama and the trauma that those young girls experienced. And so what I'd like to do, I just gave you kind of an overview and summary of what's been going on, but I wanna talk very briefly about what makes someone do the things that Diddy is accused of. So let's get into it. Again, I am not here to diagnose Diddy or anyone else, but I am here to talk about the allegations of that behavior. So the motives behind someone engaging in any horrific act or, or behavior like rape, sexual assault, um, sex trafficking, and doing things to other human beings against their will or without consent especially for a long duration of time. In this case, we're talking about allegedly 30 years. 30 years. I mean, really, this is deeply concerning and disturbing. But again, my understanding is that's what um, happened with R. Kelly. But it's it's really like peeling back the layers of a, a rotten onion. You know what I'm saying? Not, <laughs> not just an onion, but a rotten onion. And each layer that you peel back reveals more ugliness beneath it, more stench, more disgusted layers of filth. That's what it's like. So first off, let's talk about power. Perpetrators of these types of crimes often derive a very sick, manipulative sense of control and dominance by behaving in such a manner where you can rape someone, you sexually assault someone. So these actions, these behaviors, again, rather than seeing a person as a victim, they or seeing the person as a human being, 
They view the person as an object. And we've all heard objectification and we understand uh, what that means. But people who, who engage in this type of behavior and have absolutely no moral compass or no um, empathy or compassion toward the other person and the pain that they, or the damage that they might be inflicting on another person, instead of seeing the victim as a human being, they see their victims as objects to be used, to be discarded at their whim, feeding into their very um, disgusting, twisted desire for power over others. Now, that's power. Let's talk about entitlement. You know, we live in a society of entitlement. Everyone feels entitled to something to some degree. But when it comes to a person's um, sexuality, when it comes to them um, having the power to consent or not consent, when that the power of consent is taken away from a person, that becomes a problem. So the entitlement that you can take away someone's power to consent is a problem. And some individuals believe they're entitled to whatever it is they want, whenever they want, including other people's bodies. And I just feel that, again, I work with so many traumatized women in the sexual assault space. And I can't even begin to tell you the trauma that many of these women um, feel, but to have their power taken from them to consent to whether or not they want to engage in a certain sexual act, to me, that is an entitlement that far exceeds, um, um, it far exceeds the dirty and uh, filthiness of an onion. It's just downright sociopathic. And this sense of entitlement, I believe, some it can often stem from, and I hate to make this about gender, but I am going to make it about gender just in this case, because men, I've worked with men who have been sexually assaulted as well. So not so much that I want to make it about gender, but I am going to make it about gender in this context. And so when I'm talking about this sense of entitlement, I believe that it stems from a warped sense of gender roles. Um, sometimes it's societal privilege. And then we come to just plain old simple narcissism. Now, of course, there's an argument to be um, made for those who have been assaulted sexually themselves and they turn into predators and we can we can at least acknowledge that but at the end of the day when we're talking about the duration of 30 years of a certain type of behavior we're talking about someone who has pathology so deeply embedded in their nature that they it turns them into almost um, an entitled monster and so another factor to consider, and this one, this one is definitely um, arguable. We we can we can argue about this one. We'd love to know what what you think. But another factor is impunity. I think that if someone gets away with these these immoral, hideous, traumatic crimes, if they can get away with these behaviors once, they become empowered and emboldened to believe that they can do it again and again and again. And then finally, we can't forget about the normalization of violence. I do believe that in some circles, especially those where Oh, shoot. Do I want to say toxic mascul masculinity? I'm going to use it for the sake of this, this story in this case, simply because when a person believes, because 
again, these are all alleged stories, so I don't really know. I mentioned gender earlier, but I've heard some things about, you know, men also being um, raped and forced to do things that they did not want to do either. However, they're still despite the gender, despite whether it was committed against male or female, there's still this male toxicity, this, this dominating masculinity that runs rampant, um, of course, against women, but I believe that in some instances against men, and it's, of course, it's a sickening mindset. It's a power dynamic. It's someone imposing their will on someone else. It's someone dominating another person. It's, it's, it's taking away another person's voice and ability to have autonomy in decision making and so for me that's a problem that is a that is a problem and this 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 sickening mindset it continues to perpetuate a cycle of abuse and trauma and then so as I, I wrap this this portion of what I want to say up, as I wrap this up, um, there there's a a, a trauma um, component to this, and so I want to circle back to that because I mentioned it earlier, and I and I kind of added it at the last minute, but I, I want to talk about this because someone mentioned that Diddy was in some way manipulated and forced to do things that he didn't want to do and therefore he was abused and there was a power dynamic involved in this manipulation and abuse that caused him to feel helpless and vulnerable however he also benefited from um servicing or pleasuring this person but at the end of the day he turned around and did it to others and so again is this because he himself was abused and therefore um, this is some form of trauma reaction or response and he's living it out. Um, maybe, but when you're talking 30 years, 30 years of manipulating, abusing, misusing and hurting other people, at some point in time, you own and uh, take responsibility for your behavior and actions. And so, of course, there's also, what I'm talking about now, this issue of trauma and mental illness. Some perpetrators themselves, of course, may have been victims of abuse, which leads them ultimately to this very interesting warped understanding of relationships, what they are, what they aren't, what they um, could be, and a warped understanding of what boundaries are. Remember, boundaries are very simple. It's where I end and where you begin, begin. That's the boundary. It's the gap between where I end and where you begin. Well, there are no boundaries in sexual assault because the violation itself is um, across boundary. So in some cases, there may be, of course, underlying mental health issues that, number one, go untreated. They're exacerbated and it, it um, forces them to engage in some way in predatory-like behavior. But again, perhaps the most, what I believe to be the most absolute insidious of all is the culture, unfortunately, the culture of silence. Those around these perpetrators who are silent and complicit, and continue to enable these crimes because that's what they are, they are crimes, and they cover them up. They don't talk about it. They protect the person who's doing it and then even in some instances participate. Now, whether it's turning a blind eye, victim blaming or actively covering up abuse, this culture enables perpetrators um, to continue their reign of terror. And that's what it is. That's how people can say, yeah, this has been going on for 30 years. 
It's a reign of terror, which has gone unchecked. So in the end, there's really no simple explanation for why someone would commit such unspeakable acts over a span of, again, as I said, 30 years. But here's what I do know. It's a toxic brew, a toxic brew of power, entitlement, impunity, normalization of violence, trauma, and societal complicity. And I believe that that is a cocktail of evil, just downright evil that can only be combated with unwavering vigilance and a commitment to justice. So I would love to know what you think. Hit the like button if you haven't done so already. Subscribe to my channel. Uh, share this video with someone else if you feel that it is necessary. And remember, it is so very important. Keep your mind matters in focus. And I will see you in the next video.